many acres are you cultivating right now? Okay, the, yeah, I'm uh, cultivating uh, about eight acres of a uh, garden. We have about 120 acres or so of grassland, and there's about 120 acres of forest. So our farm is half forest. Yeah, so you can sort of see the, the forests a field, and there's grass, more forest. So at some point there might be an aerial view of the farm, but I really like the idea that uh, a farm should be really diversified and have lots of different stuff there. So I like to have wetlands and forests and meadows and pastures. We have a uh, 40 head of cattle. Uh, there's, you know, chickens and pig every, every now and then. Uh, and then uh, we have these uh, gardens then that produce this, all this food that leaves the farm. And that food that leaves the farm is primarily, you know, carbohydrates, and proteins, and food, you know. And that food is made of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen primarily. And that is what I'm getting from the air. So I found people that are willing to buy transformed air. It's amazing. <laughs> and if we play our cards right, a farm should be able to just grow a bunch of stuff and be able to take off a small percentage of it. Now, we can't be too greedy. So if I say I export 150,000 pounds of produce, mind you, I'm growing millions of pounds of stuff on my farm. We grow all the hay for our cows. That, but that stays on the farm. It's fed to the cows. We're growing all this trees that drop all their branches and stuff. And the cover crops and every field, you know, gets these uh, uh, green manure crops and stuff. So we're growing a lot more than just what's leaving the farm. Yeah. So that's how we feel like we're able to do it. And that uh, actually leads into what I want to talk about now. And uh, I call this uh, making a contract with nature. So whenever I till the soil, I feel like I'm making a contract with nature. And I'm promising that, you know, if she lets me till a little bit and get a crop so I can make some money, so I can buy my beer, then I am going to repay her. And I'm going to do this with compost, cover crops, crop rotation, and remineralization. And so those are all part of my tillage. And so we're going to just talk about each of those individually. So compost. This is our milk cow. Christina always has to have a picture of her milk cow in whatever slide she, show she does. <laughs> and yeah, so we take the hay and manure and soil that's left over from where we fed our animals over the winter and we pile it up with the front end loader and make compost piles. We add uh, biodynamic preparations to these piles, and these are uh, herbs that we've rotted in animal organs. And then we just let that set for a few years. Uh, we may turn it uh, a little bit, but I don't turn it five times. I don't try to get it to 150 degrees or anything like that. I just want to make some really good compost. And uh, so compost, doesn't have a whole lot of NPK in it, but what it has is a lot of microbes and a lot of dormant microbes, and it's that life that's in the compost that was so valuable. And so when we put that onto our fields, we try to put it on at least 20 tons, if not 40 tons, per acre per year. And so we're putting a lot on. And after a few years, the soil just gets really silky and soft. You can really feel it. And uh, <clears throat> we're uh, uh, big believers in compost. Uh, a lot of times when I give a lecture, I'll, I'll say that I really only have two answers to any of your questions. One is, I don't know. And the other one is, use more compost. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, big believer in compost. So that's a really important thing. And then uh, uh, this is a picture of me spreading some kind of mineral. It could be wood ashes, little rock phosphate, lime, 
Uh, this is really important, particularly in the southeast. So uh, again, I keep going back to where I grew up. I grew up in Illinois, where they had just had a glacier 15,000 years ago. We haven't had a glacier for over a million years. So the southeast has very mineral deficient soils. And so we have to add some minerals. Uh, the clay subsoil does have some minerals, but they're all very locked up. So it really behooves us to, you know, put some wood ashes, about 400 pounds to the acre. Put uh, lime on, maybe three to 4,000 pounds to the acre. We'll put, uh, around here you can get this, this granite meal and the, the things like that. This, the, 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 just the sand down in these creeks, I'd be getting that and putting it on my fields. Or run it through the compost pile, get some of that, that sandy, minerally stuff and put it in your compost pile. And that way it gets incorporated into the bodies of earthworms. And every time the earthworm poops, there's a little bit of minerals coming out. So the minerals are really, really important. And, uh, and then cover crops are extremely important. You just grow something and, and, and we plow it back in. And, and uh, so all our fields get this treatment. We may crop a field two times, uh, get two crops out of a year, but it'll almost every field we get at least one or two cover crops each year. So this is kind of the way I'm paying uh, nature back for uh, all this. And then crop rotation is another important thing so that you're not taking the same thing out of the soil every year, you're taking something different. And so uh, uh, crimson clover, as we talked earlier, works with carbon and uh, oxygen and nitrogen, getting that into the soil. Uh, daikon radishes work with uh, sulfur. Um, I'll, I'll give you a trick. So uh, uh, after our uh, cucumbers or summer squash or corn, potatoes, things like that come out of the field in August, you know, we've gotten a crop, they're done. So what I'll do then is I'll uh, clean that field up and take a five gallon bucket and put about four gallons of buckwheat seed in it. And then I'll take maybe a quart, two generous handfuls of crimson clover seed and put that into the bucket. And then I'll take a handful or a few ounces of any kind of seed from the brassica family. And this could be the subsoiling turnips, it could be uh, or daikons, it could be turnips, it could be kale, bok choy, Chinese cabbage, anything like that, collards. So then I mix this all up and then I go over some clean land that I've been cleaned up and I just throw this out and a five gallon bucket will do about a quarter of an acre or so, maybe a little more. And uh, I'm just sprinkling it out as far as I can, you know, like this. And I, I, when I do that, I don't look at the soil. I look up at the sky so that I'm throwing it like this. And I can see the seed against the sky. If I throw it, if I'm looking down, I, I can't really see it, you know, because it's just soil and seeds all looks the same. But I just try to get an uneven spread. And this is something you can learn how to do. Uh, I don't have a seed drill, otherwise I'd use a seed drill. Uh, yeah, so uh, what happens then is that buckwheat's a really quick growing plant. And so the buckwheat will shoot up and get this tall in a month, in August, in September. Yeah, it grows real fast. And it makes white flowers, and it's real pretty. And buckwheat uh, has a really interesting effect on the soil. So it doesn't have the... Uh, ability that the grasses do to finally divide the soil into smaller grain particles. And it doesn't have uh, the deep taproot like the legumes. What it does is it makes a ball like this. Have you, you ever grown buckwheat and pulled one up and it makes kind of a ball of soil? And I also thought, well, that, that doesn't seem to be doing what the book, I thought, you know, was supposed to do like these other things. But what I found is that ball of soil then really crumbles easily. And so what it, buckwheat is famous for is it liberates calcium from the soil. It can do this better than any other, I don't shouldn't say any other plant, but most of the plants. And it somehow is able to use the limestone rock that I was spreading there a minute ago. <laughs> it can take that limestone rock and incorporate it into its body, whereas other plants can't do that. So 
uh, the other plants require animals to get that limestone in their bodies, and then they get it from the animal wastes. So uh, what happens in soil structure is that uh, clay is an aluminum silicate, and it compacts like this. And so you have these potassium aluminum silicates are really compacted, whereas calcium, uh, if it can get into that matrix, then poofs it out. And so calcium makes soils open, porous, and loose, and friable. These are all good things. Yeah. So uh, buckwheat's a great plant. And then we have the brassica family, which is working with not with calcium. They work with sulfur, phosphorus. These are the light bearers. And so these elements are really important for agriculture. So sulfur is a catalyst. A catalyst means it's uh, something that's necessary for something else to happen chemically, a chemical reaction, but it doesn't get used up in the process. So if sulfur is there, lots of things can happen that can't happen if sulfur is not available. And so if you ever pulled up a turnip or a daikon, you might notice that there's worms on it. The worms like the worms love that sulfur that's around that, uh, that root. And if you break open a member of the brassica family, particularly a daikon, you can smell the sulfur. It's that, that wangy flavor, flavor. Yeah, that's sulfur. It's uh, really important. And then, of course, the uh, legumes uh, work. A bacteria makes little nodules on the plants. You know, I mean, when I was a kid and I pulled up a plant and saw this kind of stuff, I was like, oh, no, something's <laughs> getting on my plants. This is terrible. No, this is a great thing. And so uh, uh, in ancient agriculture, legumes were very, very highly stressed. And uh, uh, all farms had to grow legumes to, to, get, to help get this nitrogen cycle going back. And all farms had to use those minerals and put on wood ashes and uh, rotate their crops. It was, uh, in the Middle Ages, a, a farmer couldn't choose what to grow. A farmer might have 30 acres at his disposal and he was going to grow barley in one field, wheat in another, and potatoes and turnips in another field, but the farmer didn't get that choice. These crop rotations were made by the priests and the lords, and they'd been worked out for centuries, and they knew that this field was in wheat last year. You can't grow wheat in that field again. You had to grow it in something else. And so these crop rotations then had been worked out for a long, long time and were followed very strictly. Yeah. It was uh, illegal in England, as, even as late as the late 1800s, if you were leasing land and you grew corn and then beans, it was illegal not to put that land back in clover. It was a law. <laughs> Out of every four years or two years, the land had to be in grass and clover. Yeah. So these things were very well known and, and, uh, and very uh, important. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so then uh, uh, my next sentence is something like, okay. I've made my contract with nature, me and nature shake hands and off we go. <laughs>